You heard of diesel clothing? You can go into diesel today, and what they have is they have these Facebook mirrors. So you can put in your Facebook identity and take a photograph of yourself and send it to your friends when you're trying on clothes. <laughs> now, why, did, why have they got that? Well, what they saw kids going into these clothing stores taking photographs of themselves <laughs> yeah, as they walked out of the change room. And they're like, what are they doing? And they're sending it to their friends on Facebook, saying, should I buy these clothes? You know, I think, who on earth would ever do that? But then think about the behaviour. How often have you gone, to the girls particularly, you go shopping with your friends, you're at a, at a clothing store, and you ask your girlfriend with you, how does this look? Does this, uh, does this suit me? Is the colour good? Right? So they've just amplified this. The technology has amplified this behaviour. By 2020, almost half of the retail banking customers in this part of the world will be Ygen, digital natives. And they've only ever growing, grown up knowing a world that has a mobile phone and internet in it. So they're not used to these traditional ways of approaching things. They think differently. Let me illustrate it this way. This is my daughter, Hannah. She's 11. Very cute, isn't she? So <laughs> Hannah, I asked her to try to get the mindset of, of these kids. Um, and this is pretty typical of this generation. I said, how would you pay your best friend? Her best friend, Tia, lives in Dubai. We lived there for four years. She said, oh, I'd, I'd probably SMS it or email it to her dad. Now, to her, that's completely logical. She lives in a world where that sort of communication is completely normal. So I, I said, what about this, Hannah? What if we get a piece of paper from the bank and we write Tia's name on it and the amount of money that you want to send her and we send that to her in an envelope in the mail? At the other end, she can get that piece of paper and she can take it to the bank and exchange that for money. What was I talking about? A check, right? So what was my daughter's reaction? Oh, Dad, don't be silly. No one would ever do that. See, no amount of me trying to explain to her the concept of a check will get her to adopt a checkbook because she just doesn't get that. That's not efficient for her. She doesn't, why would I do that? She doesn't, un, that doesn't understand. But yet, when we get kids coming out of college and university today, entering the workforce, what's the first product we give them when they walk into a bank? A checkbook. Wouldn't it be better to give them a mobile phone? I mean, that would make a lot more sense. Give them a mobile with a mobile banking app, mobile payments, all of that configured. That would make a lot more sense in terms of getting customer loyalty and being relevant. Okay, so the first phase was the change of psychology and control. The second phase is the raised expectations around mobility. The third stage is where it gets really scary, is around integration of payments into the mobile device. So today, we know that you can, like checks are in terminal decline. We don't have to worry about that for too much longer. But now what you can do is you can take a check and you can deposit it just by taking a photograph of the check on your phone. You don't have to take the piece of paper into the branch anymore or deposit it in the ATM. So this is the latest technology around checks. But checks are gone, so what's, what's happening next? We're already starting to see a change in behaviour. Today, lots of people who have access to mobile banking are using it more frequently than they did other channels. Internet banking took about seven years to get to that critical mass point of view. Mobile banking is going to get to the same volume of interactions in about three years. That's about a 400% increase in adoption. Mobile payments is going to be even faster. So who's playing in the mobile payment space? Well, this is Square. I don't know whether you've heard of Square. So what you do is you go onto a website and you register with Square and they send you out this little piece of plastic you plug in the top of your iPhone or your Android phone. It's a, they call it a dongle. I don't know why they call it that. But you put it in and you download an app to your phone. Right? You register on the site, you put in your name, your address, your bank account details. And then you just fire up the app and then guess what? You can swipe a credit card and receive a payment on your phone. Your phone just became a point of sale terminal. Now if I go down to Standard Chartered here in Hong Kong today and I'm a small business owner and I want to get a, a credit card machine, you know, these point of sale terminals, they say, okay, well, here's a contract from Amex, here's a contract from Visa, here's a contract from MasterCard, here's a contract from Diners Club, here's a contract from the bank, here's a contract from the network company, and we need you to give us a deposit for the point of sale terminal. So if you're a small business owner, which of those two experiences would you rather go through? 
obviously Square, which is why today there's already half a million users on Square and three million dollars a day going through the system. And these guys are less than a year, year old. Simplicity is a key to the change that's happening around here. And this is the Google Wallet. So this was just launched last week um, by Google in the United States and you use your Google enabled NFC phone NFC stands for Near Field Communication or Near Field Contactless Technology. So the Octopus card uses this. You don't need to swipe the Octopus card, you don't need to insert the card in a machine, you just touch it. Right? So what we're doing now is we're incorporating this technology into the phone. The Google already has this. RIM with BlackBerry is incorporating this in seven phones uh, this year. Nokia has it in the E7, a number of phones come out with that. And the new iPhone 5 will most likely have NFC in it. So you'll be able to use your phone just like an octopus card. Punch in or program in a credit card, just put in the number in, and register the card, and then now use your phone as a credit card or debit card. So everyone, this is really cool, I can use my phone. But bankers who have been in the business for many years, what's the big deal? You replace plastic with the phone, and what's the big deal? It's not really that exciting. Okay, it's a bit of a gimmick value to it. But you know, it's not about replacing the plastic. So the trick here about mobile payments is not about the fact that it's a payment device. The phone is a payment device. It's what you can do with this. I can put your account balance in there. Imagine how powerful that is now. Before you go to make a payment, knowing how much credit you've got left on your credit card, or knowing what your debit card, whether your salary has come in to your debit card, or oh, yes, I can afford that big screen TV, I just got paid my salary, these sorts of things. The context of the payments, that's what's really powerful. So Google today is starting this NFC trial. They're taking no fee on interchange, which is the fee that the credit card companies charge when you use your card at a store. They're not taking any fee on that, and they're giving away point of sale terminals. And a lot of banks are going, we don't know what the business case is for mobile payments. We don't see that yet. Google's giving away point of sale terminals and not taking any fee on interchange. What do they know that we don't know? Well, they know that it's advertising around the context of payments, which is massive. That's the new business. This is uh, Hana Bank in South Korea. These guys have a great mobile app. What they've done is not only have they created just a straight banking app where you can see all your, your, your banking uh, facilities, your summary of your expenses and those things, but they've also included contextuality in it. So depending on what location you're at, when you're out and about, you can fire up the app and you can get a shopping coupon for retailers that are in the area. And how do you do that? Well, you just go into the app and then you just shake the phone and they give you discount coupons. So here we have M-Pesa in Kenya, Globe in the Philippines, PayPal, Zopa, the Octopus Card, all of these new forms of doing business that traditionally would have been done by banks, but they're actually doing it better. They have innovated on the banking model. These are all things that would have been done by banks before, but all of the things that these businesses have in common is none of them are banks, but they're starting to infringe on the banking sector. Why is that happening? What's happening because there's a gap opening up. Customer behaviours changed very quickly in the last few years as a result of technology. And banks have not responded to that change in technology. So that gap is being filled by other organisations who are responding to that changing behaviour. Let me explain it in a little bit more detail. The internet obviously started this shift in behaviour. So we have internet banking, we get on internet banking, 8 o'clock at night, we can uh, log on, we can pay bills, we can transfer money. Do you remember what it was like before the internet? We had to go down to a physical place between 9 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon or 4 in the afternoon to do these things. We didn't have any choice. So suddenly now we have, we're in control. You know, we can sit at home at night and do these transfers and do these bill payments and we're in control as a customer. But it's more than that control, it's also choice. Now it's very transparent in terms of you know, what financial service companies there are, what products they provide, how they fit into our lives. And we can compare them side by side like this. So this is a tool called uh, Google Comparison Ads. 
So you can do a search on mortgage and see all the different mortgage companies, their rates, the features of the products. It's very transparent. If you're a bank, what do banks say they differentiate on? They say they differentiate on product. Can you differentiate on product or rate in this environment? Absolutely not. So when, what do banks say? Well, we differentiate on branch. But hang on a second. In the mid-80s here in Hong Kong, the average customer would visit a branch twice a month, about 20 times a year. Today in Hong Kong, the number of visits annually to a branch is 2.3 visits annually for a customer to a retail branch. Why are customers not going to a branch as much? It's quite simple, isn't it? It's not the most convenient way to do our banking anymore. There's far more convenient ways of doing banking, including the internet. So our behaviour's already changed around this. And it's more than that. Our behaviour around search and the way we find banking products has changed. So we use search. We start when we're looking for a personal loan or a credit card or a mortgage. We go to Google and we type in the name of that product. That's how we start our journey for looking for a new product in the banking arena. For a home loan, a car loan. That's how our behaviour is. But did you know that YouTube is actually now the world's second largest search engine. So what happens when you type in the name of a bank, like Citibank or Bank of America into YouTube? Well, you get user-generated content. You get people talking about the bank. And it's not very flattering, right? So uh, Citibank fired because she was too sexy, apparently. Why Bank of America fired me? The debtors revolt from Ann Minch. Uh, Bank of America wall, wall, walk out. Why Bank of America is bad for America? So if you're a bank and customers find you through search and YouTube's <coughs> the second largest search engine in the world, you've got troubles right now. How do you change this? Well, the problem is that the way we're moving in terms of search is we're moving to relevance. So from a branding perspective, I know I don't want to... Uh, the branding guys are going to talk a lot about this in the future, but in the past... A brand was able to send lots of marketing messages out and say, we're a fantastic brand, you should buy from us because we're a great bank. Today, what's happening is search engines are starting to incorporate results based on what our friends think of different products and services. So the search results that come to the top of the search engine will be based on what our friends like, the brands that they trust. And this is the thing, I can spend millions of dollars advertising, newspaper ads, TV commercials, radio, all of these things, direct mail, apparently they still use that in Hong Kong, okay. all of these things telling you, you should buy from my bank because you can trust us, we're a good bank, we have the best product. But if my friends tell me that that bank sucks, then what's your advertising worth? Nothing. So what's the future? I just want to wrap this up. The future is context of banking. It's putting banking into our everyday life. So when you go to a travel website, that's where you get offered travel insurance or that's where you can take a personal loan for travel. When you're out and about um, shopping, instead of receiving an envelope in the mail saying, oh, don't forget to use your HSBC gold visa credit card this month and you get 10% off if you go to Hugo Boss. Instead of that, what happens when you walk in the Hugo Boss store? You get a message to your phone. And suddenly, when that starts to happen, instead of thinking, oh, the bank's trying to sell me something again, which is our reaction when we get an envelope in the mail, we say, wow, that was great service. It changes our relationship. We're out looking for a mortgage. And instead of uh, ringing up the bank and the bank says, oh, don't get ahead of yourself. We don't even know if we're going to lend you the money yet. What we'll have in the future is we'll have this built into our phone. So this is Commonwealth Bank property evaluation app. You can fire up the app, look around at the houses in the neighbourhood, see any that are for sale, see what value they are, and then go and apply for a mortgage right there on your phone. This is not the future. This thing's happening now. So who are our customers? What are they doing? When are they doing it? How are they doing it? This is the key to the future for banking. Understanding customer behaviour and building experiences and journeys around it. Yet in the past, as banks, we thought this was the sort of valuable information our customers want to receive. And they need a translator, a banker, to help understand that. But today, we don't value information like that. We value information that's simple. We value processes that are simple. We value customer journeys that are simple.